Welcome to our data formats and procedure standing committee meeting today. I think after four years was the last working group meeting in Canberra, so it's a long time ago. We only had a short status report at the technical workshop in Stuttgart. And so um, today I would like to talk about a few topics which were ongoing in the last years. And so you can see here the agenda of the two days meeting. I also would like to welcome our online participants and also my co-chair Randy, which is hopefully online. And in our presentation today, in our working group meeting, we have three main topics. So Randy will talk uh, virtually about the implementation status of the CAD format and the CPF format. Then uh, Justine will talk about a new task in the data and formats and procedures standing committee which um, works on quality checks on the ILRS Scenix products. And the third talk will be about, from Matt about a status report about his normal point software. Before we start with the first um, presentation from Randy, I would like to ask you to put your names here on the attendance list so that we can see who was here today, and there's one column where it's written, became a data formats and procedure member, or if you are one, please make a yes there. And if you would like to become a member and you are not a member already, we will put you then on the data formats and procedures mailing list that you get information about ongoing tasks in future. So I will let it here. Thank you. And now we will switch to our first presentation from Randy. I will. Is Randy allowed to share his presentation or should I? Yeah, I, I can share mine now. Uh, we just went through that with the setup just a couple of minutes ago. Okay. Let me just, let me go One ahead and uh, share that. One moment. Are you seeing this? Yes. Yes, okay, excellent. As most of you are probably aware, we've had some revisions to the, the consolidated prediction format for all the predictions for SLR and lunar and so forth, and, uh, but we range at the ILRS and for the CRD, which is a consolidated uh, ranging data format. We move from version one to version two, and the title pretty much tells us that story. The statuses were done pretty much. Let me go ahead and talk, give you some of the milestones of the, of the changes to the CPF and to the CRD. I'm not covering the actual changes because we've that's available online and it's not uh, time in time constraints, I don't want to spend time doing that. Let's talk about the milestones for anybody maybe in the future who wants to do this whole project over again for something, version three. So this is the history. Uh, the first announcements was were in first in October of 2017, a report to the Data Formats and Procedures Standing Committee in Riga. Uh, next uh, November, we a paper was presented to the general workshop in Canberra. Uh, from that point, things were set up on the ILRS website, and we had the first predictions on the ILRS website in December 2018, which is the lunar predictions from UT. March uh, of 2020, 2019, not 2020, 2019, the SLR predictions from the NASA Ops Paraton. And 2020, there were more, many more providers uh, from various um, groups. So by the June of 2021, all but one of the providers was providing a version two um, CPS as well as version one. The, that one, we could never get, I could never get a response from them. And it really didn't matter because every, there were plenty of prediction providers that were covering the same satellites. I don't know what's happened to them since. So the official transition was then on October 1st of last year when all the stations were expected to use only version two. Well, one of the 
prominent stations had some problems that they couldn't control and couldn't get, even though they'd shown that they could use the version two in testing, had some issues and couldn't actually use it for some time later. So the effective transition then became 1st of January, 2022, which at what time the prediction providers were free to stop distributing version one. And then the final transition milestone will be this next January 1st, which will be uh, the data centers will cease the pro processing of CR CPF version one. Now on to the CRD, same time for the announcements, October 2017 and November 2018, the changes to the CPFs were minor, but some of them had to be in line with the CRD changes. So the first data files from C, uh, were from in 19, is 2019, Grotz, Ron Sprello and Hertz Monceau. Now there were some considerable changes made to the headers, the data file, the data records and the configuration uh, records. Now, there weren't any in terms of the satellite range of the epic or the time of flight. So that wasn't really a, a big concern at the beginning. So Van Hussen uh, is part of the vetting team. Is Van there today, by the way? Um, I want to take some credit for that. He was uh, spent a lot of time as data came in, making sure that the station's data actually did uh, did uh, comply to the format. Now, there's software at EDC and uh, as in sample code that was actually used to test a lot of the data before it ever got out of the stations. The stations could use that EDC software online to test their files to make sure that they actually met the format. And what Van did is making sure that if, if um, field A was filled in as a certain uh, value and field B was uh, filled in on some value, were those compatible? In other words, it did checks, uh, relationship checks that the software didn't. And they all caught a number of things that a lot of the stations were having problems with. So that worked out very well. And uh, of course, Van deserves some credit for all that work. Uh, Ericos then came along later uh, once there was a, a mass of stations that had been vetted and actually ran the test of the orbit for version one, making sure and version two and version one, making sure they agreed and all was um, and all was good with that. So by the May of 2022, we had basically all the stations data available in version two. And let me take a side note here that there were several, there were a number of stations that were not submitting version two CRD data. That's because that in some cases they were in quarantine and it wasn't possible. Maybe they hadn't produced data for 90 days or something. And it wasn't possible to vet their version two data because they weren't even sending in version one. So there are also stations which we, despite repeated attempts, never heard a thing from. So a decision was made that we could either, that we didn't want to wait for years for the possibility of some of these stations to actually provide version two data. So we decided that EDC was asked and agreed to convert the data from those stations from V1 to a limited version of V2. Uh, V2 has more fields. You can't manufacture that data out of thin air. So if those uh, CRD version two files from those stations are rather minimal. Uh, EDC and the vetting team will work uh, with any of these stations when they actually are able to convert to version two. So this leaves us with the uh, official transition date of August 1st of 2022 this year, when all the analysts and others were suspected to use version two. Well, there are always people who don't get the memo and to, although we couldn't guarantee that people would continue ver sending version one and version two together. Uh, th we did uh, hold off asking the station to stop distributing version one to until October 1st, so that there are a couple of folks could, or at least one user could get uh, his conversion work in. So another, so by this, at this point, stations can stop distributing version one. 
uh, final transition milestone data centers will cease processing COD version one on January 1st of next year. So there may be some additional format issues. We're finding some things that people never really, there may be inconsistencies, things that people never uh, tested before. So um, those are very minor things on uh, that will take in, uh, what should I say, edge cases, which we'll go ahead and take care of as needed. Now, some lessons learned. A lot of these I'm putting here that are certainly things anybody's worked on any uh, project for over a period of years will already know. So this isn't anything, anything new. Uh, some of these show the examples of, I guess, Murphy's Law, where anything can go, can go wrong will. Uh, as you notice, the project really started to gain steam in 2018. In 2017, 2018, of course, what happens in 2019 is we have a pandemic. So the project definitely took longer than expected. Uh, as So we did probably lose a year, six months to a year, because of that alone. Another good thing, if you're having a, a substantial manuals that are being read by people all over the world, is have a proofreader uh, who is fluent in other languages. And again, I say thanks to Dan Dan Mao, who volunteered to uh, review the manuals. He did a wonderful job. And hopefully in my successive um, conversion or um, correction since then, I haven't messed things up. Uh, format checking on the EDC website I was mentioned uh, earlier was very effective in helping people and helping stations and others to vet the new version two files, both the CPF and, and uh, CRD files. Well, format changes help us find other issues. The CRD2 vetting caught some of the, some errors that had been there on the CRD version one files that were being sent, being sent in by some of the stations. That gave us the option of correcting those errors at the stations or having the stations correct those. So that's good news, bad news situation. Communication is really important in this uh, situation. Uh, we've got, a, of course, this is true of everything in the ILRS. We've got organizations around the world, different languages, different countries involved. And it goes beyond that because in this case, we <clears throat> the prediction provider providers had to be convinced to provide version two of the CPFs and the stations had to be convinced to use them and the stations had to be convinced to, to um, produce CRD version two files and the analysts had to be convinced to use them. So it came, comes out to be a, well, I have remind, 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 and more like nag, nag, nag. <laughs> so uh, I think everybody probably appreciates that type of thing. So this is, um, there's also already, I mean, there's always a situation where there's one more pr uh, proposed format change. Well, we went through a couple of those with the calibration records. We also went through that with the uh, NA, the not, uh, uh, not applicable, not accessible, not available. And that delayed us a bit also, but that's taken care of. And I think there was one more proposed change after that. And I sort of said, uh, you can do that in five years or 10 years. Um, another point, there will always be one group who won't be done in time. We all know that situation. I explained a couple of these. And there's always be one more question regarding an inconsistency in the format, and that's who we're still do, dealing with that. So, so anyone who ever wants to take over uh, doing uh, format changes uh, in the future will at least have, uh, is warned. And uh, with that, I'll turn the uh, turn the presentation back to Christian. If there are any questions, please let me know. CPF and the CRD format. Are there any questions from the audience to Randy? Are there online any questions? Probably not. So at this point, I would like to thank you, Randy, <laughs> thank for you. the big effort you put uh, into the development of the CRD specification. Also pushing the stations and prediction providers for implementing them. I also would like to thank Van 
who looked at the data and pushed also the stations prediction providers to fix their format issues. So, and all the others who were involved in this long process of finishing this transition to the new, new format, which is now already done, I would say. Christian, I'd also like to thank Chris Moore, who spent a lot of time working uh, with me on the changes to CRD version two. Yeah. And yeah, so as Randy said in his last slide, there are still some questions regarding um, format inconsistencies or open questions. So um, there are still some ongoing questions, as Randy said, for the calibration record, and also yesterday in the analysis working groups, um, new issues popped up where some um, question raised up. So I think there are still um, questions which has to be solved regarding the formats, maybe to explain the current values more in detail in the specification or maybe to make some small fixes. But I think overall um, the, the biggest part is done and so now we uh, working on the fine-tuning, let's say, on the specification. So, thank you, Randy. You're welcome. So, we are coming to our second presentation, which is about the implementation of the new Sinex checks, which is, is given by Justin Hu. here because the presentation is here and you can switch it by yourself. everyone, so we're going to keep this one pretty brief. Um, we're looking at implementing some new Sinex checks from the data centers and we currently don't have any um, checks done on Sinex and the reason why we're looking at having this done is for format compliance, file consistency, primarily because it'll be useful for new users to have this information. Um, also when we start switching over to the cloud at the CDDIS, if we have to change into a cloud-friendly um, format, which makes it e easier for um, new users, we'll have a smoother transition when we have this level of consistency within our files. And so the checks that we're looking to do are actually quite simple. Um, we have only two that are really from the Sinex format itself, which is a header record to say there's a, this is the start of the file and then to ensure that there's an end of the file. Um, for the rest, we're looking at having checks for all the files moving forward, we're not going back and checking any of the older data for this um, because we believe that quite a bit would be rejected. But we'd be having um, several header, header, sorry, several several block names that we'd be looking for, which are the file reference, input history, site ID, site eccentricity, solution epics, solution statistics, solution estimates, and solution matrix estimates. We also have a few that would be specific to the um, ILRSA ITRF 2020 and ILRSB ITRF 2020, which are the model and range biases, model target signature ge geometry, and model time biases. So we do plan on having a discussion about this a little bit later on, not today, because we all want to make it a happy hour. Um, and so the CES will be reaching out to the Sinex providers to see um, how it is that they are impacted once we have these issues um, checked for. Currently, we're going to have them as warnings, and after a transition period, we'd like to switch them into being fatal errors, which means the files would be rejected. But that's all that we have for this um, very brief talk. Thank you, Justine. Are there any questions regarding the new quality checks which will be applied in the future for the ILS products. So the procedure will be probably similar to the CRD. So the um, ACs will be informed if we find any issues and you have then the 
possibility to correct it. So, but I think there's, till now there's no fixed date for the transition, so at the moment we are still checking which fields are checked and what are warnings, what are errors, and so maybe we have to get some feedbacks from also analysis centers. So we are working with Ericos together to get information which parameter should be checked or which should be warnings, but it will probably take a bit of time. Um, it may take a little bit of time, but there aren't too many errors from what we're seeing currently with the runs that we're doing, so we're hopeful. Great, thank you. So I think we are now good in time for the icebreaker. So we are coming to our last presentation given by Matt about his um, normal point software developed at the Hurstman Zoo station. Hello. Um, so this is an update, uh, but I'll, I'll, I will talk about uh, uh, this software in case you, you don't know what it is and what it does. Hopefully some of you have, uh, have tried using it. Uh, it's called Orbit NP, um, and, it, and it generates uh, normal points from, from uh, satellite laser ranges. And so, so uh, uh, Christian asked me to give some updates, uh, so I'm gonna, I'll keep, get you up to date with the latest versions. So at the SGF in Hurstman Sioux, we use a Fortran program called Solve, and that produces flattened residuals, and we then, we then uh, go from there to, um, to generate normal points. Um, I translated this program into, into Python, and then made it more versatile in, term, in terms of uh, working for, for all stations, and then and working off the command line, and, and, and having different, uh, putting different options, uh, different predictions, that sort of thing. Uh, it's called Orbit NP, and it's available to download through the RLRS um, software uh, web pages. Uh, it can be used uh, at stations either as some example code on how to how to form flat residuals using Orbit Orbit corrections instead of instead of what might be uh, the current use of poly, of a polynomial fit. Uh, so it's there to, it's there as an example code, or it can be uh, or it can be used as an analysis to, tool. If you want to look at lots of passes for a particular satellite from a particular station, then, then it works very well by, by uh, picking up a, a CRD um, large monthly file, and you can go through and look at, look at the passes for, for, for what you're interested in. Uh, it takes in epochs and ranges. Uh, this can either be in CRD format or, or a, a raw data file of, of just, of just uh, two columns, epochs, and ranges. It requires a, the corresponding reference orbit. Uh, it, it needs the, to know what station that, these, that these, uh, this data came from. It needs to know the modified Julian day. Uh, and you can also include the calibration records and the MET, and the MET records. And if you give everything, give all the, uh, put all that in, then you'll get out um, some final flat residuals uh, and, and plots, which you can see in the bottom right corner, which looks, looks, like, looks like that. Um, the software can also then, once you've got the flat residuals, it can also apply clipping in different, uh, in different ways. <clears throat> So um, this has been available on the RLS website for a number of years. Um, I I've, I've must, must remember to recognize uh, working with Randy, Randy Rickliffs, who uh, was, was very helpful each time I uh, wanted to release a new version. Uh, he, he, he's been using it in, in, in Texas. Um, so in, the, in, the, in this, this version 1.1, 1 .1, um, the software now includes a, a quick pass iteration option. Uh, which was useful uh, for, for data that was um, uh, not evenly distributed along, along, the, along the satellite arc. The station coordinates are no longer sort of hard-coded into the code. They're now picked up uh, from an ILRS uh, Sinex file. Uh, it calculates peak minus mean, um, something that's, that's been discussed quite a bit in particularly the quality uh, control board is is uh, uh, defining the peak and and uh, the value of peak minus mean that, that appears in the normal point record uh, and how to define peak and so one way of doing it uh, is, is is a tangent fit to a smooth profile and that was added uh, in this version 
Um, also, uh, they added the option of including the unfiltered range measurement. So in the CRD uh, full rate uh, files, there is a flag called a, a filter flag, and that that's, uh, includes extra data uh, around the, uh, the, the the satellite track, uh, which can be which can be included now with this option. Version 1.2 uh, included a Gauss fit clipping, uh, a, a, a different uh, default method for uh, determining peak, which is a one sigma mean, iterative mean. Uh, it can calculate the 50 record now, which is the statistics of the whole pass uh, record in the CRD. Uh, and maybe not, not every station has included this, and so if it's, if it's uh, not there, then it, then, then, uh, it, it, it can be generated. Uh, equally, um, uh, an output in, in CRD format is now possible. It can now filter on two levels, um, which is related to this CRD uh, filter flag. Uh, so it indicates which, which ranges were used for normal points and which are, are, are extra in, in, included in the full rate data. Uh, a center of mass uh, offset option is now there, and that, that helps occasionally to, uh, to flatten the residuals. Um, I added, I looked at slopes of normal points, uh, and also um, you can now select the, the SLR station from, from a list when, when you put in a large uh, monthly CRD file. And then finally, um, uh, the very latest uh, version uh, it now includes uh, CPF interpolation was, was replaced, and so um, the, the, the way that I import the CPF into the into the program, I was doing it through a Python interpolation um, uh, function, uh, and I didn't know what was causing a problem. And I was going. I actually spent a very long time on this, trying to fix what I could see in the residuals for particular satellites, uh, particularly the HY two uh, B two C, uh, and that was that would that that. Was only only went away when I replaced this um, this interpolation uh, method with a high order polynomial fit, and that got rid of the, these artifacts. Um, the matplotlib uh, subplot needed needed uh, recoding because uh, uh, the, the the latest versions of of the software uh, no longer allow the way that it was being done. Uh, and then finally, I changed the way that we that we plot the the, 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 the final plot in that I just clear the current matplotlib window uh, and and replot for a new pass. And this uh, dramatically increased the speed of the, the, that you can actually uh, go cycle through cycle through different passes in a CRD um, uh, in a CRD file uh, because you're not reloading matplotlib every single time, so you can you can plot much quicker. Um, so that was. Um, so that was the final update. Just to pick up a couple of things, I did talk about peak minus mean. So this is a, a plot indicating what I mean by a tangent fit to a smooth profile. The uh, the, the tangent with the lowest um, uh, lowest slope is, is indicates where the peak is. But the default now is a one sigma iterative mean, um, and, and which looks a bit like that. Um, clipping can be done in <clears throat> a number of different ways. One is just a uh, a, a, a iterative mean uh, with a, with a calculating an RMS. Uh, second is now is fitting a Gaussian profile uh, and then taking the peak and the RMS of the profile and clipping uh, clipping according to that. And also uh, we can uh, clip by finding the leading edge half maximum and then setting values uh, in front and behind in behind of uh, behind that point. And this is what I mean by two level clipping. Uh, so the the black points uh, on that plot uh, are the points that we use to make a, uh, a the normal points, but also what will be, what would be included in the full rate data file would be the uh, the surrounding points, uh, with a, which essentially have a wider clipping value, and they can be of interest uh, for for future analysts to pick up uh, from the full rate data file. So that's. Um, that's everything. Um, to, so it's available to down through, download through the RLRS software web pages. Um, please, please uh, uh, pick it up and, and, and try it out. I'm not planning any major updates at the moment, but I'm certainly open to suggestions of where this where this code could go next if it was helpful to anybody uh, who's got anything in mind. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt. Are there any questions? Um, Matt, I have uh, two questions. One is, can you handle epochs to one peak a second? And the second is, um, is there a minimum number of data points needed in the normal point before you compute uh, the peak in minus peak? Um, you did, uh I don't know if I've set a minimum for the for, in order to calculate the peak. I imagine it would just go through the process and do a pretty bad job of the, you know the number coming out wouldn't be uh, very good if it had so few so few points in the normal point. The um, problem is when the data set is sparse, and um, you know what happens. Yeah. Is that a meaningful quantity at that time? Um, yeah, you know, I, I do. I do. <laughs> we, I'm used to being, you know, kilohertz data now, so, so I, I, I forget that uh, it can be very few points. And yeah, the the the, uh, the peak is, is isn't isn't uh, very much value if you if you have so many so few points. Um, uh, and I guess, I, um, yeah, maybe there's a correct way to to uh, to to proceed if it, if there's so few points and and not try and uh, adjust anything from the mean. Uh, uh, your first question um, was about the picosecond resolution of, right. of epochs. epochs yeah. yeah, so um, it, it reads, it will read in that 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 resolution. Um, the 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 the, um, the number is a is a double or, or Python a Python double. So so that would that would read it. I am. Um, uh, Occasionally, when you print to the screen, that like I've, I've seen resolution be be, be lost, but um, um, I, I believe it's it's all preserved through the through the program. So you're not truncating uh, last three digits to fit to a nanosecond or something. Sorry, I can't hear you. Something. So you're not truncating if the resolution of the epoch is to pick a second. You're not truncating the the least significant bits and actually fitting to the peak second level, or is it to the nanosecond level you fit? I, I'm not doing that. I'm, if the resolution that you put in is going, going into a, a, a large, a large um, Python number, so um, that's, that's all I'm doing. I don't. Maybe I misunderstood, but one of the options in your list of potential actions by the, the operator, so, so to say, is to uh, remove the satellite signature to make it more flat. Is that a constant thing, or is it depending on geometry, as we saw earlier today? Um, you, it was I, it was particular passes. Um, I, I've struggled to uh, to make flat, um, particularly. Uh, um, on some grats that, that that are clipping very hard at the at the front, um, and that was that was one option that seemed to seem to get closer to, to the results. Because really, what all this needs to do is produce some flat residuals that you can then make normal points with. And so, if if adding a uh, an extra offset enables it to uh, to 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 get where it needs to be, then then uh, that was that was sort of the best option really. But it's just a number up high to, uh, to, to the range. Any other questions? If not, I will have a small question. You said you, um, your software is ready for the latest version of Python. Does it mean it's ready for Python 3.11 already? Or is it what's the latest <laughs> one in your case? <laughs> we'll, we'll see when that comes out. <laughs> uh, no, it was, it was um, Tom had a very, a very uh, 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 the latest version of Python and, and tried to run it and, and uh, was able to point that out to me. So, um, yeah, who, yeah I, I didn't know that was going to happen. But, um, but I'm, if anyone has experience that, that they can feed back to me, then, then uh, I'm happy to fix it for the benefit of everybody. Okay, thank you. So the next point on our agenda is the other business. So are there any other things we... If uh, you would like to discuss, or are there any comments? Or if not, I have a small point. Is Randy still online? Can you? 
Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so um, you told me last week that you would like to step down as co-chair um, of the Data Formats and Present Procedures Standing Committee after this transition to the new format is fixed. So at this point, I would thank you very much for your effort you put into this job the last, I would say, probably almost decades. Am I right? Because I think you were always involved in this data formats and procedures standing committee. And so it was really a pleasure to work with you to develop the new specification and fix the of open issues. So thank you very much, Randy. So this will bring, bring us also to the next topic that we need a new co-chair for the um, Data Formats and Procedures Standing Committee. So um, I'm not sure how the procedure is done normally in the ILS. So I think we have to collect suggestions by the working group and then one has to decide. So if there are any suggestions who could be a good co-chair, please let us know and then we will tell you who it will be in future. And then the last point of our agenda was the next meeting, so I assume the next meeting will take place next year, hopefully, in Peru, and then all issues are maybe solved or new issues came up, so we will see the future knows. So, thank you very much, and I think we are good in time for the icebreaker.